Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Patrick Rowe. I manage the EDU team here at Guidebook, and I wanted to welcome you all to the conversation. This is Guidebook's Fireside Chat, a new opportunity for current and potential Guidebook users to hear from industry professionals about the emerging and changing events and resource landscape as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and various responses. Our goal over the next 30 minutes is to allow you to join in and listen to a candid conversation. This is the first in our new series, so make sure you stay connected with us to learn more about our future events. I'll be introducing our guests in a moment, but I wanted to share a thought to help get you in the right mindset. As we were working on the details of this conversation, I was reminded of a valuable experience that was all too common prior to the pandemic. Often when attending conferences, I received the most value from the casual conversations that grew and expanded after leaving a particularly well done session. My hope is that you'll join me in the feeling of returning to normal by listening in as we chat today. In advance of this event, we requested that registrants provide questions to us to cover during the talk. Thank you to those of you who reached out in advance. We'll be using those questions as a guidepost throughout the conversation. Because of the nature of this talk, we will not be able to take questions as they come in. However, we do have a team that will compile your questions from the chat and will provide responses in a post event email. Also, just a bit of housekeeping, we will be recording this conversation and we'll share the link in our post event email. Let's jump right in. Joining me today is Brenda Knox. Brenda has decades of experience in virtual and online education, and she'll be sharing with us some insight into how schools have approached the new learning landscape and what schools can be doing moving forward. Brenda, thanks for joining us. Hi. <laughs> Do you mind providing us with a brief background of your professional experience so far? Okay. Um, I have about 25 years of experience in instructional technology, instructional design, um, and online course and program development. Um, I've worked at a number of elite universities, um, but I am not speaking today from the perspective of any one of those. I am speaking of, from my perspective, from all of them and all the professional development and conferences that I've done and all the reading that I've done and what I know about from all of my colleagues at lots of institutions. That's great. I got involved in online education for the education part of that, not the online part of that. So my perspective is pretty often from the education per side of the conversation. But as time has gone on, of course, everyone knows technology has become an integral part of all education, whether it's in the classroom or technically online. Excellent. That's great. And uh, you know, when we were first introduced, I was really excited given your background because I think you do bring a really particularly unique perspective to something that um, was really thrust onto universities uh, pretty quickly. Um, and that actually segues really well into our first question. Uh, so if you can think back uh, to just over a year ago, the timeline from the emergence of COVID-19 in the United States until the, the need to transition to virtual instruction was pretty short. Can you talk mm -hmm. about that rapid shift to online learning due to the pandemic? Yeah, you're absolutely right about it being rapid. I mean, some faculty had about a week and some people had less to uh, adapt to that kind of situation. Um, the first thing I'd say is that what people did in response to the pandemic in order to keep learning continuity going is not what we would define as online learning before the pandemic. Um, online learning then was really defined as very carefully designed courses aimed at a population of online students who had chosen to take courses online. Um, and they usually involved a lot of lead time for design and production. And so some schools understood that and purposely didn't use the word online education. They would say something like remote teaching or flexible teaching or distance teaching, but they didn't say online education. Um, some of them did say online education, and that'll be a little confusing for those of us who work in that field later, but um, schools varied a lot in what they did or could do depending on their resources. Um, even within schools, individual faculty varied a lot on what they did. There was a pretty much a, a continuum. Um, 
from the faculty member who simply turned on some kind of online conferencing software. Let's not kid ourselves, it was Zoom. Um, <laughs> and just continue to teach in the way that they had in the classroom. To the faculty on the other end of the continuum who took the opportunity at their institution to learn more about different instructional technology and about different teaching styles, um, including things that were more, more asynchronous than synchronous. Um, and those faculty did very different things than the faculty that just turned on Zoom. Um, and they had different strategies for teaching. Sure, sure. Yeah, there really is a, a really broad spectrum there. And I think it, it aligns really well with the fact that, as we all know, faculty are all very different individuals in their own right. And from my perspective, and, and let me know if this sounds right to you, it seemed like programs did the best they could with uh, the super short timeline. And, um, yeah. And, and I'd like to hear if you could kind of follow up on that a little bit. Have you seen any kinds of shifts over just this initial first year um, from either mindset perspective of faculty uh, who have tried one or the other and, and any kind of conversations maybe that you've had um, with them about what that has looked like? I think that, um... I'm not sure that faculty, any even individual faculty member shifted that much. Um, initially, of course, people thought, oh, this is temporary. It's going to last a month. And then we were back in the classroom. So they made a minimal investment in their of their time, which usually meant turning on Zoom, right? Mm -hmm. um, as the pandemic stretched out and as at the beginning of the summer, faculty learned that their courses were going to be online or at least partially online in the fall. Uh, they began to look more closely um, at some of their other options. Um, at least some of them did, right? Um, but I think in general, the the attitude that a faculty member came in with sort of stayed. You know, um, either I'm going to do as little as I can and just keep teaching the way that I was teaching um, to a faculty that were more open to changes in conversation and development, you know, personal development, professional development. Um, and that's fine. Um, online education is not for everyone, which is why people are often, some students are really unhappy and some faculty are really unhappy right now or uncomfortable. You know, they'd like to go back into the classroom. Um, so that doesn't surprise me and I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, and others were more ready for that kind of a change. Sure. No, I kind of threw you a little bit of a curveball there, but that was that was great. So, so thank you. Um, let's kind of keep running with this and talk a little bit more about the um, the academic integrity of programming. Uh, can you talk about the transition to online learning and, and the effect that that had on academic integrity and some of the approaches that that schools have taken or or could be taking? Yeah, I think that um, academic integrity, just like it did when online education was becoming more prevalent and more accepted, um, academic integrity was a big question uh, for a lot of faculty and for a lot of administration when we shifted to this kind of teaching. Um, and in online education, we might have gotten a little farther in that conversation than, than general faculty were who hadn't taught online before. Um, the initial focus was on proctoring software. So those range in uh, their methods of ensuring academic integrity from stuff that's highly technical that's watching your keystrokes and your eye movements and which um which applications are up on your screen uh to something that's simply got a camera on you you know and is watching what it, somebody something is watching whatever's within that camera screen and it it ranged from things that were automatically monitored by a computer um or an algorithm to things that were just human monitored. And if you were looking at a human, looking at um, what you can see on a camera screen in a class of 400, nobody was looking at everybody all the time, right? So it was more of a deterrent because it could be a problem. Somebody could see you doing something. But it, there, it, there's ways to get around almost every proctoring software. And if somebody's determined to cheat, they will, um, which is also true in the classroom. If somebody's determined to cheat, they'll find a way. Um, I think that uh, it's, it's an example of people sort of basically trying to replicate the classroom again. Um, and replicating the classroom either with 
just full Zoom teaching or with proctoring software um, is always going to be a slightly less effective imitation of what actually happens in the classroom. Um, a better approach in general, and this is the instructional designer hat in me talking, is, is to do more authentic assessment than the kinds of things that are easy to cheat on, like a multiple choice exam. Um, and that approach has two steps. One is thinking very carefully about what your course objective is. So what is it you want students to be able to do, not the subjects you want to teach them, but what is it you want them to be able to do after they've finished your class? Not during class, but after it's done. Like if you walked up to them after they graduated and said, have you used anything for my class? They could tell you something. Um, and then design an authentic assessment based on what you want them to be able to do. Um, instead of doing a multiple choice exam about business strategies, have them actually develop a business plan as part of their assessment. Those kinds of assessments are much harder to cheat on. Um, and the more you have interactive learning in your class, the more you know a student's voice and uh, capabilities before they ever take the assessment. And you, you can tell if it's not theirs. Um, without needing proctoring software. So I think that's a better approach overall, but there are certain circumstances, certain high stakes environments when the purpose of the class is, is basically to develop a vocabulary that they can use to go into other classes where multiple choice exams are exactly the right thing. Um, and for those, some people are gonna have to use proctoring software. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. Yeah, I like that. I like how you're focusing it a little more on, you know, what are the results are. So rather than just saying, how can I take what I've always done and kind of force it on you in a new format, reversing that a little bit and thinking more of, ultimately, we want the same end result. I recognize now there's a new challenge. And so how can we use what's available to us now to get get that newer objective out of it? So I like that. Yeah, that's the instructional designer doing backwards design in me. Yeah, well, and it's a great Start approach. With the outcome, you know. Right, right. Yeah, that reverse engineering makes so much sense, and I think you know, in, in similarly to, similarly to so many aspects of our lives, we get very um, comfortable in a, in a process that we've always done, and then when when new shocks come to our system, uh, it's almost easier to get even more comfortable. Uh, <laughs> whereas it may be healthier to kind of step away and say. Is there a perspective that I, I don't currently have? Um, and and, or step and given back, yeah, or step back yeah. a little so you can see a bigger picture. Right, right. that's hard yeah. to do in a crisis. I'm not saying that. I don't fault anybody for sure. Not absolutely, being able to do that in a crisis. Me either. No, Brenda, you are spot on, and and that's why I kind of share that caveat. It's it's human nature to 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 get comfortable, right? Uh, more comfortable mm -hmm. in those types of scenarios. So, I'm um, I'm hopeful that. You know, uh, you mentioned earlier, um, we, the initial approaches that a lot of programs took was this temporary focus. And so I'm hopeful that, that as we've gotten through a full year of this, there are more opportunities for, for all of us uh, to, 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 to recognize that need or, or that, that opportunity to step back for that perspective. So that's, that's excellent. I think that was, that was really insightful. Um, our focus so far has been on the faculty approach to what these experiences can be like. Do you have any information um, about how technology has enabled students themselves through this rapid transition? Um, learning is fundamentally a social activity. Um, people don't really think about that, but it, it happens best when students not interact not just with the instructor, but also with the content itself and with their fellow students. So that's why when we design online courses and programs, we also pay attention to community building as much as we do to the academics. In a face-to-face -face classroom, it's just like you were saying about conferences. As people are walking out of the room, they start talking, right? Um, and that they, they may be talking about the content, they may be talking about going to lunch together, but getting that relationship between them helps them make a better sense of what they, the academics that they get. Um, so even in the last five years, the technology to enable video chat and online conferencing has just improved immensely. Um, 
um, when I think about five years ago, it's very, very different than thinking about today with Zoom <laughs> and with uh, Skype and with lots of those things. The fidelity's improved on them. Um, and also the ease of use has improved on them. So both of those things have improved, even if they existed before. Um, it makes it much easier for students to stay in contact with each other, um, with their instructors um, during this pandemic. So I, and, I, and I think the ones that have been happiest have used that capability to, to stay in touch. Um, it's not perfect, obviously, because we hear about the mental health consequences of students being apart from each other, but um, but it's better than it would have been if we'd just been emailing each other. Uh, there's just so many more um, visual cues you can get, tone of voice, body language, those kinds of things from a video chat. So that is has helped, I think, students a lot. There's also a lot of tools that if faculty had incorporated them into their coursework, um, are very interactive, um, meaning the students interact with each other and with the content. And when they did that, I think that also helped students learn rather than the kind of lectures and question answering that they might have had in a classroom. So I, I can rattle off a list of some of them. Um, uh, one is VoiceThread, which lets you have conversations around media in context. There's Hypothesis and Perusal that let you do social annotation. So if you're in a, a humanities field or social sciences and you want students to annotate a document um, or English, um, they can do it together basically and see each other's annotations. Um, there's things that, there's a lot of different softwares that, um, that let you put questions into video. So if you've created video for part of your lecture, rather than doing it through Zoom, you can add questions and have the video stop and students have to answer those questions before they come back like Play Posit or EduPuzzle or H5P. Um, even the results that those students do can sometimes be captured and put back into a learning management system or gradebook. Um, there's just Google Drive and Google Docs and other formats for collaboratively editing. So they're editing with other people at the same time. Things like Flipgrid, um, even creative uses of technology they're already really familiar with, like Twitter or Facebook or hashtags anywhere, Instagram, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I think those things have helped students. All of those things have helped students um, do better. Sure. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's great to hear. I think um, even, you know, from my perspective in the professional world, what, what I look for sometimes is like, is there, you know, I, I want simplicity. Is there one place I could go to, to do all the things that I, I need and I want? And the reality is for me and, and also likely for instructors who are reimagining or re-reviewing uh, their objectives, the need for the use of multiple different tools is probably pretty high um, if you want to receive the outcomes for those objectives that you're looking for. Um, and so, you know, I think going back to what we were talking about a little bit earlier is, is a recognition of, of the, the output and the objectives themselves and then starting to research and learn more about the tools that can help you meet the very specific needs. And then maybe searching after that for opportunities to solidify or, or um, you know, can condense those into into the most e the, the easiest format for, for your audience to kind of digest. Yeah. So. yeah, we often tell faculty not to try more than one tool at a time, you know, mm -hmm. take take yeah. one step and as you mentioned, totally focus them on what their objective is, you know, uh, just because a new tool is the hot and fancy thing at the moment, <laughs> you know, sparkly and shiny, doesn't mean it works that it accomplishes anything for your particular course material or your objectives, right? So only use the minimum amount of technology necessary to accomplish those goals. Don't, you know, it's, don't throw it in for just because you can. Right. Yeah. Um, that, that's definitely true. That's a good point too. Again, human nature, we all want to use kind of the thing that it's being talked about right then uh, because we think, yeah. oh, well, that's going to help me meet my need. I mean, the reality is if you haven't kind of sat down internally and, and discussed what your need is to a very specific point, um, it might not be anything uh, of value for you. So that's great. Yeah, I, I also just want to emphasize that that list I just threw out um, is not comprehensive by any stretch <laughs> of the imagination. There's millions of other pieces of software that people have found really useful in, um, in accomplishing their goals. And you mentioned uh, 
really wanting things to be all in one place. And that is a base, also a basic tenet of online program design is to make the interface that students have to deal with as seamless as possible. You know, uh, you definitely don't want them to have different logins in different systems or have to move from one system to the other. And often the thing that ties all of these tools together is a learning management system where students either link to the other tool, preferably it's been integrated in such a way that if they're authenticated into their LMS, they'll be automatically go into their account in the other tool, mm -hmm. or even deeper integrations um, using learning technology interoperability standards, so LTI for short. Um, so that, like for instance, with PlayPosit, the answers on those video questions can go back into the gradebook. Um, so that that's really important if you have the instructional technology team to make those things as seamless mm -hmm. and usable as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you uh, I like that a lot. We don't want to just, um, e even as software seems like it's kind of, you know, the magic bullet for our need. We have to be thinking much bigger picture as to how it integrates with what already exists, whether that's in my process or the departmental process or at the university level. Yes. Um, we all, all very important. Uh, and having worked in higher education before, being a guidebook, I know there's a lot of hoops to jump through in that, but. Um, make doing your research, recognizing the value of different tools, and then being able to make your case internally can be a really, really impactful step to that. Let's talk a little bit about that university um, approach as a whole. So we've talked about faculty, we've talked a little bit about students. Let's talk um, kind of bigger picture there. Um, how have you seen successful universities over the last year um, transition to um, or, or you transition to utilize technology uh, to adapt a little bit better? Um, first, I'm gonna to have to say what my definition of success is because my <laughs> Perfect. Is good to other people's. Um, <laughs> and my definition of success has to do with student learning and did the students learn at the same, in the same way or at the same depth um, with the same outcomes that they did before or possibly better? Um, was it at least as good as, right? Um, and it's, but it's focused on student learning, not on, I don't know, money saved or <laughs> anything like that. Um, and I'd say there were sort of three characteristics that defined universities that had what I'd call a successful transition. And one of them was what we just talked about, um, enabling seamless access to the technology that they already have. So if their user interfaces weren't very seamless, they fixed that fast. Um, and they, they weren't afraid to make the investments they needed to make to fix those things. And they listened to the people that um, told them where the, where the bumps were, where the barriers were to those things. Um, the second was that they provided faculty development, uh, training, support for all of the faculty that needed to use all these materials. So that took different forms at different institutions, depending on their context and their resources. Um, but faculty who felt supported and felt like they knew what their options were and knew how to do them, um, those schools did better. Those students did better. Um, and the third one is that if they needed to adopt a new technology because there was some gap in what they had, they were able to do that quickly too. I, there are a number of schools that switched from uh, their existing online conferencing software to Zoom, we all know that, um, in the throes of the pandemic, they, they started new licenses with Zoom, primarily because Zoom was simpler and provided all the things they needed um, rather than so conferencing software that was really more designed for having meetings than it was for teaching. Great, yeah. I, anticipate I say that schools that had a good faculty development, instructional design, instructional technology, infrastructure, but also culture, Mm -hmm. um, where for that focus on teaching and that focus on faculty development was there and it was someplace faculty knew to look for help, um, they had better success. Mm -hmm. Follow-up question to that, if I find myself at a university who maybe wouldn't meet your idea of, of, of having a successful approach so far, um, are there small things or directions or, or changes that I could to implement or um, encourage among other members of my, my faculty and staff to help kind of right the ship and, 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 and start to turn at least the experience of, of the group that I can manage 
right? Mm-hmm. Um, in, in, into that, a better culture of, of that virtual and online learning feeling? Well, one of the things I would say is look around your university and see if there are centers for teaching and learning, if there are uh, centers that support instructional technology and make sure that, that you're tied into those centers. Some centers, at some schools, they just are a very small footprint. And so people didn't know they were there um, and didn't know to look to them. So if, if you have those resources available, go use them, go talk to those people because they know more about this stuff than anybody else does. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems to me <laughs> like you're just left having to self-educate about these things. And I don't know any way to do that other than to read and to um, go to conferences, which of course we can't do live now, but I just <laughs> attended a conference virtually and got a lot out of it um, the same way. Um, and by that, I mean conferences that focus on teaching and learning, as well as instructional technology. Like, um, yeah, um, Educause has a subconference or a subgroup called ELI, um, Educause Learning Initiative, and they focus very much on online education or the use of instructional technology to supplement face-to-face education um, from an educational standpoint, not from a technology standpoint as much. Sure. Um, so groups like that, um, try to reach out to them and their professional resources online, um, better, usually better than the resources on a particular tools commercial site. Not always, but usually. It, it'll give you a better overall perspective and then you can evaluate what the individual vendors are saying about their software. I love it, yeah, a lot of cross-referencing there. I think that's good. You, know, you never wanna go down just one path or the other. Well, you know, you mentioned um, a great way, a great thing that um, individuals can do is, is basically to educate themselves a little more and to, to find other resources available to them. And I'll, I'll say it right out, Brenda, I think today hopefully was a great step for a lot of our attendees towards getting those kinds of initial pieces of information and, and having a good direction. We have just two more minutes. And so I'll pose to you one more final question. Um, and it's something you and I, I think, really started our conversation talking about weeks and weeks ago, and that is, if you could give us, you know, one or two um, sticking points that are, that you believe are, are, go- are going to come out of what this past year plus of, of education has looked like, that would be really helpful. And then after you finish, I'll, I'll wrap up for just a moment. Um, I think there's, there's two things that come to mind immediately. And one is that probably the most important one, that I hope sticks <laughs> is that lots more faculty now um, by necessity have been exposed to those kinds of resources at their university and those kinds of tools that they had to figure out a way to use. Um, and even more importantly, that they got some information about teaching strategies and ways of doing things that is different than what they were ever exposed to before. Um, getting a PhD in something definitely doesn't educate you to teach it, just knows just the material you know really well. Um, So having exposure to teaching and learning centers and to instructional design as a strategy, um, I hope that and the the exposure to all the tools that are available to them sticks with some portion of those faculty and it maybe changes the culture at that university a little bit to one that's more focused on what's the outcome that I'm trying to get um, and what are all the resources available to me to do that. There's not just one way. The other one is that I think universities have realized how mission critical their instructional technology is um, in order to maintain educational continuity in the event of a crisis like we just had, but also overall. Um, And I hope that that they appreciate not only their technical infrastructure, but also their human infrastructure and they maintain a commitment to that financially and otherwise as time goes on. I think that was great. I'd love to see both of those outcomes, uh, you know, just from my perspective. And, and uh, I, think, I think you're spot on with, with anticipated trends moving forward. That's great. Well, um, Brenda, thank you so much. This was, I actually really enjoyed this. Uh, this was a lot of fun. I mean, just for everyone uh, who's joined us, um, thank you all for being here. We did receive a couple questions during the call. So we'll be responding to those in our post-call email. Um, But that wraps up our first fireside chat. As I mentioned, make sure you're going to continue receiving 
um, our marketing emails with information about future chats. But again, Brenda, thank you so much. Any final words? Oh, no. Thank you very much for listening <laughs> to me. You are, you are wonderful. Thank you. And um, we'll talk to you all again soon. Bye now.